we'll try to get to as many questions as we can before we do the car side chat. Uh, the first question is from one of our visit from one of our visitors from Holland, uh, Marius. He says, "Dear Jack, what would you do if you today were 40 years old, living in Europe, and the effective cost of in, uh, investing in a global index fund was one percent a year?" Move to America. <laughs> Well, it is amazing how the cost structure in the U.S. is terribly stacked against the investor. And this is probably the cheapest company, a country to buy mutual funds in. I'm not sure that the, old, the overall brokerage system is, is any cheaper, but the mutual fund expense ratios are lower. And uh, I, I can remember it. We used that after the index funds started to get a little recognition, which took a long, long time. Uh, people would come in, I remember one group from Germany, and they said they'd be fun to start an index fund. And uh, not quite the way they said it, but that was close. And uh, I, yeah, we got a bit, what a great idea, blah, blah, blah. And they said, now, for it to work for us, we need to take 1% a year out. Well, I said, you know, there goes the index fund. There's not any point in an index fund. That you're taking 1% a year out for distributing, and you probably charge another 1% uh, for managing it, and there goes all the magic. So they left, and I, you know, I, I really like to let people down easily, but there's no point in beating around the bush either. Uh, and that is, it all depends on the efficiency with which you provide the index. So for a European investor, first that, that involves, I think, extremely interesting asset allocation problems. But I, and I just talked about the central problem, which I think is the cost problem. But the asset allocation problem is a, you know, one I've tried to deal with a little bit intellectually, uh, which is, you know, I, I believe that it's fine to have all your money in the U.S. We've beaten that ground over and over again. Everybody tells me I'm wrong. Uh, I need a little reinforcement. I hope somebody else will tell me I'm wrong this week. <laughs> uh, yeah, the more I hear about it, the more I'm sure I'm right. But you know, it, it's easily to be, uh, I could easily be wrong. You know, I can't predict the future of the markets. But uh, when you get to a European investor or an Australian investor, you know, they want some balance between their home country, I think. Uh, but not if you're in Finland, where there's only one, one company that's 80% of the Finnish market, uh, Nokia. And uh, so it, it changes from country to country. But for a European investor, leaving the cost aside, I'd say it probably should be. You know, even if you're, God forbid, in France, and the UK is much better uh, in terms of their economy and their prospects for out of this economic mess that we have all over the world. But maybe 25% in your home country, 25% or 50%, I know that's a big difference in other international, uh, non-US, and 25 to 50% in the US. Something like that, I think, is the intelligent thing to do. But you know, there's, uh, I'm glad I'm not facing that option with this nice person in France. Or where were they? Holland? The next question is, so, Dear Jack, would you recommend an individual invest all of their assets into Vanguard funds or spread the risk to one or more other index fund banks? Well, it's, it, it, it's a, basically it's a cost benefit analysis. Clearly, I would you know, hold my own money as a banker, and I'm not really worried about the company going down. Although, to bring up an issue I did not touch on, we probably are a systematically important financial institution, SIFI. And uh, I think we, we giant fund managers are going to have to be, uh, get used to a little more government oversight, whether we like it or not. Two trillion dollars is a lot of money. It's five percent of the U.S. stock market. And the mutual fund industry, the top five firms, I think this, this latest report from the government said this, top five firms are 50 percent of the assets in the fund industry. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, kind of, and they're almost all index firms, by the way, uh, well, except PIMCO. And uh, you could argue they were close to an index firm anyway when you get to the bond area. And uh, so their, their correlation is probably 95 or something like that, very high, because they tend to be in the bond area. Uh, so we have to be very, very much aware of all that. And uh, still, uh, you know, if, if you want to have, let's say, half of your money in Vanguard and half somewhere else, first, I'm hard pressed to tell you where to put the other half. And second, you're probably going to have higher costs. So is that higher cost? Are going to be worth the 
maybe sleeping at night better feeling. And uh, you know, honestly, if I had money in some other mutual fund group, I would sleep less well at night. <laughs> I'm an insider at Vanguard, or sort of an insider, or a former insider, or a quasi-insider, or a virtual insider. <laughs> Some kind of an outsider, I'm not sure which. <laughs> but um, I'd say no problem. Uh, we offer the same, basically, protections, custodianships. Uh, and I'd say, given the character of our company, uh, you should be able to be comfortable uh, that there aren't going to be ethical breaches, uh, or ethical breaches that jeopardize the value of your securities, uh, or administrator or burdens that will say not give you liquidity when you need it. Although well, I worry about, you know, I worry about just about everything, I guess. But I worry about the value of liquidity in the mutual fund industry. Uh, you know, maybe if we were less liquid, we would have more, more long-term holders, for example. I mean, look, so the promise of liquidity, as we all know, is something that not everybody can have at the same time. Uh, and uh, so, when you get to our level, particularly in something like municipal bonds, where the markets are very uh, not so darn liquid, uh, and uh, so you do have those kind of problems, and could have those kind of problems with Vayner, we're by far the largest municipal bond manager. And uh, I, I should have the answer to this question, I don't, but I, I require them to have a 15% liquidity reserve at all times, because we had such a cost advantage that we still have a competitive yield, having 15% basically in very short term, municipals cash ready, just in case. And uh, that came up in 2007 when we had a crisis in the municipal bond market. Ian McKinnon, who ran our bond funds, was in the hospital at the time. So I was running the bond funds. I was, you know, they, the portfolio managers basically reporting to me during this period. And it was an awful period because the market was falling apart. Our shareholders wanted a lot of liquidity. And we had to provide it. And that's the first thing you do. You say, we're going to have the liquidity and no matter what. I can remember the bond managers and one more anecdote coming in and saying, well, you know, Goldman Sachs is bidding, we have to sell, have to sell some bonds, and Goldman Sachs is bidding 95 and a half for these bonds, and they're worth 98. And what should I do? And I said, the answer is very easy, but I'm thinking about it. Sell them. Sell them because that's the going market, that's what you can get for them. You have to have the cash, there's no way around that. And believe me, if I know Goldman Sachs, if they're bidding 98 and a half today, they'll be bidding, they'll be bidding 95 tomorrow. So get them the heck out of there. And uh, so we survived that crisis, and that's where the whole idea of the Swiss Army came up um, for the first time, and training people at Vanguard uh, to be the guys that would think answering the phones was a little beneath them, perhaps. And uh, just they were always ready. Uh, we had we they were all trained to handle telephones, so we didn't get lines backed up and all that. And uh, they also learned something very important, particularly the portfolio managers. That there were human beings who owned their funds. It wasn't just some big numbers game. And uh, I think that was at least an equal part of it as compared to being ready for an emergency, which of course, when you're ready for an emergency, that doesn't usually happen. So we've been from 2007, no, 1990s, that year was that crisis. Uh, I guess it was 1987, 1987 when all this happened, when we were much smaller, but it was still a big problem. And uh, that's when the Swiss Army began. I think that's been a good thing for us, although so much is electronic now compared to telephone that probably is less necessary. But I think the training of letting people know that there are human beings on the other end of that telephone is absolutely central to everything I believe about company philosophy. Uh, I think this question relates to, if I remember correctly, uh, an article in the Financial Times. Victoria asks, Jack, are we parasites? <laughs> well, that, I could have talked about that earlier, but that's where these diversions come in and that, that, that intrude on my day and make me push things aside to respond. And there was a very, I think, naive article by a UK money manager saying that indexing was parasitical uh, because it took advantage of the efficient markets created by active managers. So we didn't contribute to the efficiency, uh, but we, we capitalized on it. And first place, that has nothing to do with, uh, you know, whether Mark, I mean, I, I've never believed totally in, in efficient markets. I believe sometimes yes, sometimes no. Long run, almost certainly yes. Short run, almost always 
almost always no. Uh, but uh, so, I, but I did take the guy on. He mentioned me, and he mentioned Vanguard about being the fomenters of this parasitical behavior. But I took him on and actually cheated. But I changed the question a little bit, and I said, "Look, a parasite. There's this host body over here, and the parasite is taking something out of it. And in this business, we're all parasites. Uh, no question about that. We're a parasite that takes six one hundredths of one percent." out of the host body, that's the mark of return. And you, sir, are a parasite that takes two and a half percent out of the host body. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, if you don't think that's important, you can't it over a while. So we had a little back and forth. He wrote back. I didn't, didn't answer his third thing. But I felt better at having done it. <laughs> the FT has always been extremely kind to me and my ideas. And it's kind of nice. I just, Maybe a little bit financially snobbish friends who won't read the Wall Street Journal, won't read the New York Times. They read only the FT, and it's a it's a it's a good paper. And I like to joust, and they're always asking. Everybody's always asking me for articles about this and that. And sometimes I do it, and sometimes I don't. And if I can tell you, can you handle? Can, can I give you one more anecdote? This was the most fun one. So my granddaughter is coming into the office to have lunch with me, and at 10 o'clock in the morning, I get a note from the the uh, op-ed page editor, Tunku Vaginarian, his name is, the world at that time, the book journal. And he said, this little had a title and no message, don't you dot, 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 hate Davos. And uh, I, wrote, I wrote back to him and said, of course I do. You know, it's a whole bunch of self-important people getting together to reinforce each other's mis misguided ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, can you give me a thousand words on it? And I said, sure, when do you need it? And he said, three o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> and I was not about to cancel lunch with my granddaughter, believe me. So I drafted up something real quickly, uh, why I wasn't going to Davos. And, uh, and then I came back from lunch after she left. Lovely young woman. Uh, hate to see her go. Lunch was over. And uh, edited and got it in by three o'clock. It had to be in time for the European edition. And uh, so it got a lot of criticism. It was fun to write. <laughs> Probably one of the best things I've ever written, actually. And it ended up by saying, well, one reason I'm not going to Davos is I wasn't invited. <laughs> <laughs> and the other reason is I don't know how to get there. And he can <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I didn't read that the President Clinton was flying over for the final session. So if he reads this and offers me a ride in his plane, I will be there. <laughs> so yeah, you're, you're, I hope you're allowed to have a little fun in this business. I certainly had my share. Sorry to take that time. Go ahead and tell. You got all the time you need, Jack. Um, Glenn sa says I agree with Jack's critique of the total bond index tracking. How likely is it to change? And if not, what funds should we add to our portfolio to get better corporate exposure? Well, good question, and I want to emphasize that I may be a little bit of a purist on this. It, the differences are not large between, a, you know, I'd, I'd say the index properly weighted. We have things like 25% you know, of all uh, treasuries are held by China and Japan, a little bit from UK, I think. And uh, so why are they counted when the idea is how are you going to perform relative to your neighbors? Let's call it US pension and retirement plans and uh, U.S. investors generally. They just aren't part of that equation. And people can disagree with that, fine, but that's my position. And then they have a lot of shorter term treasuries that I think are much more accurately kind of in the short bill or very medium, you know, less than short term uh, government bonds. And they're in the index. Why would, why would anybody want to be that short? That said, uh, the differences are not huge. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be striving for perfection, even though you know, you know, you know you'll never get there. But the option is, I think, and I actually did this when the spreads got so wide, it was a very rare move for me to make. I moved a fair amount of my money out of total bond market into corporate intermediate term uh, index. And uh, so, and that's done fine. I mean, the, 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 all those gaps of 20 Eight have been pretty much ironed out. I'm not sure it matters that much anymore, but I just leave it in there. So uh, there is an option of corporate intermediates, and I'm trying to think here, and I'm probably slipping a little bit. 
it could be a fund run by Welling and Active, but it's an index fund. It's going to have a correlation of 98 or 99 with the index, whether we call it Active Manager or not. And that's I want to double underscore when you talk about ETFs starting to have more and more active management. Every single one except, I think, one so far is a bond fund. An active management a bond fund is day and night different from active management of stock fund. In bond fund, the tolerances are like this between active and index. In an equity fund, the tolerances are more like this between the high and the low around that. So uh, that's what you can do if you want to do it. Uh, although I think, you know, I think we need to, to lend, a, lend a hand to the investor who probably many of you in this room are dying for more income, and yet my philosophy is, you know, if you're, if you're in the bond market, don't reach for more yield than the bond market is prepared to provide you with. It's like to use a very trite example, uh, like crawling out in a limb, and you crawl out further and further and you're fine, and then all of a sudden, one step too far, snap, <laughs> a vigorous metaphor. And uh, so it's, you know, do it a little bit if you want to. Uh, I don't. Um, that's not, not a significant exception, in my opinion, that I, that I have done. Uh, but you know, basically, the market returns a certain amount, and uh, you, you just have to accept that. Uh, don't reach for more. It's a little bit like somebody that, that was out in an LGI news. Someone has lost the first seven of the eight races on the card. I think there are eight races on the card. I'm going to the racetracks. And I'm like taking every penny you have and betting it on the long shot in the eighth race. Well, you may recoup. The odds do not favor you. So try, try and stay within the simplicity, uh, low cost index, bond stock, and the like. Here's a related question from Dan Smith. He says, total bond is what it is, and the index it tracks is what it is, and my circumstances have not changed. How do I decide whether or not to hold my positions as long as I live, to put it one way, or hunker down in the Barclays aggregate, to put it another? Well, basically, I'd go for hunkering down where you are. Uh, these relative yields will change. The one thing we do know is today's yield has a 91% correlation, and we'll continue to have a 91% correlation, more or less, with the returns we get over the next 10 years. So if you buy a government bond today at 3%, and a corporate bond at 4%, 4.5%, uh, the odds are very high uh, that you'll get a 4.5% return over the next 10 years, or a 3% return over the next 10 years. And uh, so it favors you know, getting a little more aggressive with the yield side. That said, we all have, you know, I try and take, and it's impossible to do, the idea of human behavior in all this, how will investors react? And I'm afraid that once you get a little opportunistic and reach out for something else, and you'll be much too sensitized, much too insensitized to the prices that the bond fund has. And bond funds have gone down a lot, although, you know, the reality is they haven't gone down nearly as much. I and mean, you read these scare things, this is a very important point, these scare things in the paper about what a terrible year this is for bonds. And I can tell you in my own, my own experience, um, the way I do it, uh, my bond portfolio has gone down 0.9% this year. And that's because I have half of the, the munis are my direct, direct holdings, uh, tax-free muni funds, Spanish tax-free munis. And the, uh, the uh, limited term fund is down 0.1%. And the, the uh, intermediate term, I don't, I don't do long because it's behavioral reasons. Um, you know, I don't want to mess myself up. It's about 1.8%. So you put 50-50 in, you can see it's going to be 0.9. And that's Charlo for me. And you know, I wish I had everything in stocks. I always wish things like that. I always wish I had everything in the best performing asset. <laughs> <laughs> But my magic, such as it may be, is I never act in those beliefs. <laughs> and that's, a, that's really an important thing. And don't let your behavior overcome. Uh, and, you know, I, I, in, at the lows in February, a little bit like the story I told you about Gus last night, uh, I was scared 
why wouldn't I be scared? I mean, everybody must be scared. So when you're scared and, and say, you know, I really ought to do something about this, uh, I go back and read my books. <laughs> <laughs> they might put me to sleep a little bit, but... <laughs> Jack, uh, uh, we have a comment here on your comparison of active versus index fund, all in cost. Included transaction costs only for active funds. Don't index funds have some smaller transaction costs? Yeah, that's a good question. It's true that they do, but they are so small that they, they, you can't find them in the performance. Because if you look at the Vanguard index funds and you subtract our stated expense ratio, from the return of the index, you get the return of the fund. There are, the evidence says, zero actual costs. In other words, they're so small, they don't even come out to 0.1%. And that's very intuitively satisfactory. There are ways to do the trading. Gus is very good at that, has been. We have most staff of people who are we're very good at it. And most index funds are the same way. There isn't much magic indexing anymore. We used to certainly be by far the best indexer. But everybody picks up the secrets, you know. There's no such thing. Not like the Coca-Cola formula, which probably is worthless anyway. Uh, <laughs> there's a parenthetical for you. Uh, but um, yes, there are costs, but they're so small that they are not evident in the data. Jack, uh, this is, says, in common sense, your 10-year forecast used average earnings growth plus current dividend yield. For consistency, why not use average dividend growth? Uh, you could use average dividend growth instead of earnings growth. It doesn't give you as good a result, as accurate a result, because companies' payout ratios change. So if someone wants to argue that is the more pristine formula, and that's actually what we call the Gordon formula, fairly well known in academia, uh, the market value relative to the future cash flow. And, uh, and this is, they call my thing the, the, Vogel model, the, the Vogel variation on the Gordon model. Uh, I happen to like the earnings growth better. There's a great intellectual defense, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> but it works in the data, and I think it's easier to follow. And you don't have to worry about changing payouts, which have changed a lot on the way down over time. But they're both approximations, and they're, they're pretty good approximations. It's amazing to me how well that formula has worked. Uh, not, not formula for what the market will do, but a formula for uh, establishing reasonable expectations, I think I mentioned earlier what the markets will do. And none of this stuff is perfect. And I think, uh, I think we all ought to be aware of the fact that if you're looking for precision in any of these things, you know, please don't look to me for it. I don't have any precision. I have a directional idea. Uh, I have a strong idea of what creates value in the marketplace, that is to say, earnings growth and dividend yields. And uh, that's about it. And that's all you can control. But it, but it does work because it calls attention being skeptical of what the market is doing with those fundamental uh, returns, investment returns, earned by corporate America. And that's why I say, and I'll repeat it once more, I think I said it last night, I'll repeat it again today, I'll re probably repeating it to, to my dying day, which I hope is not today, <laughs> and that is uh, the stock market is a giant distraction to the business of investing. Or to put it away, I did to these professors down in Southampton and Bermuda, um, the, uh, uh, I'm just trying to remember the exact formulation I used for them about uh, the stock market is a derivative. Now, the stock market is a derivative of corporate value underlying what created by corporate America. So think about the stock market. The stock price is a derivative of the value of the corporation or the value of American business as a whole. And that gets you into the whole area of derivatives. What sense do they make? Uh, the magnification of returns, which you saw on those charts, magnified way up, magnified way back. And, and ignore it, because you know it's going to be in the long run zero. That's the nature of things. So am I dogmatic about this? You better believe I am. Does let me doubt. Anybody want to raise their hand? Oh, by the way, I, can my eyes have a question? Uh, we had, we've had a little discussion about uh, and, and I talk about this in my Financial Analyst Journal article about how to charge uh, advisory costs outside you know, financial advisory costs, sales loads, whatever, uh, against accounts, uh, against the returns that investors earn. And you kind of end up trying to approximate it. But I just want to ask you all, 
and I'll express it in a simple way and then just give me one second to explain. Uh, I'd love to see a show of hands of how many of you consider yourself do-it-yourself investors and, and if you're not, how many of you can self, consider yourself you need an investment advisor and there's a lot of ground between those two. But pure do-it-yourself means you get started and you don't have somebody telling you anything to do but your fellow bogleheads, your, you know, whatever, however you feel. And the other is you rely on an advisor to tell you everything. So can I just see a couple of hands on the number of hands that are available? How many of you consider yourself do it yourself? <laughs> wow, the message is getting across. And how, how many would say they, they need significant help? <laughs> I presume that excludes the help I'm giving you this morning. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, in the, I'm not amazed at the, the, the dominance of do-it-yourself, but I am amazed that she seems to be unanimous. <laughs> the next question is very timely, Jack. It says, given the very low level of interest rates and the bull market in bonds for the last 30 years, can you tolerate the assertion that a person in his late 50s should have no allocation to bonds in his portfolio? Well, there you get into economics versus emotions. The economics would suggest that no bonds is the correct decision uh, because we know the stock market returns or we have reasonable expectations, that's all we can do. The stock market returns will be about 7%, I think I mentioned this earlier, which will double your money in a decade. And then bond returns will be about 2.5%, I think maybe I used 3 before, which will get your money up 35%. So you've got three times as much money in stocks as bonds. And if stocks let you down, I just doubt very much uh, that they will let you all the way down below that 2.5 or 3% on bonds. Uh, it would take an unusual combination of circumstances or some kind of a crash. And, uh, and then there's the issue of, you know, we, we live in, in, everything is a risk, we know that, an uncertainty cannot be eliminated. Uh, but we know that there are certain uncertainties out there uh, that would destroy the value of both stocks and bonds. Those if bonds will, will, will let me exempt. And if the meteor strikes the earth, it really won't matter whether you own Vanguard or Fidelity. <laughs> I don't think. Uh, I'm still hanging on to my Vanguard. Uh, but um, it's, uh, that's the economic side. And if you profoundly believe that, do that. And pay attention, as I mentioned before, very importantly, the income stream you get. And not to the variation in, in uh, price. Because that gets you into the emotional side. And uh, so when your emotions start to affect your behavior, and we had another 50% market decline, I said something like this earlier, I might have used 40%, but whatever it is, you're gonna wanna change from an all stock portfolio with some little protection, an anchor to windward, call it whatever you will, dry powders. And uh, that's probably the worst time you can find to do it. So if you think you can exempt yourself from emotional problems, uh, I, I, I would say that's a, that's a good basis for for investing, just go, go all the way. Now, a lot depends on your time horizon. It's one thing if you're 22 years old, and one thing if you're 111, like yours truly, <laughs> or something. Uh, but um, it, 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 very few of us can really isolate our emotions from the economics of investing. So I'd say if you really feel like that, and it might be, let's say, 60-40 is a kind of conventional balance, you really believe in equities, you know, make it 85, 15. Uh, you'll get most of the return out of your stocks, the return your portfolio out of your stock, but you'll still have that little comfort level when things fall apart. So economics, all stocks, uh, emotions, maybe 85% stock. Jack, this next one is based on a quote that you supposedly made. And I'll just read some of the highlights, but it's relating to the general state of the mutual fund industry, specifically regarding money market funds. You well, you supposedly stated that if the money funds got in trouble, that other funds would chip in to uh, make the funds whole. So his question is, Mr. Bolo, if you were running Vanguard and the money market funds got in trouble, would you assess the holders of Wellington and Windsor or other Vanguard funds to bail it out? Well, I'll give you sort of a hedged answer. Unequivocally, no. 
<laughs> Will I make my position clear? Uh, I follow up to that. It says, if you wouldn't do that, would you just let it go down? Well, let me say my whole framework for money market funds is here an, is an instrument that can help a lot of people. A better way to save the money in the bank. Yes, the yield is nothing right now, and, or essentially nothing, but no one will be that for way forever. But when the asset value of money market funds fluctuates. Mm -hmm. And to conceal that asset value fluctuation by holding to a so-called dollar price mm -hmm. is, I think, leaving the public with a misleading impression of what they own. So I would say, let the fund share value fluctuate, and then the marketplace will work. If someone thinks they're, they're we'll now moved to a $10 asset value instead of a $1, and so it goes to 9.98, or 9.96, whatever it might be, or 10.03 or 4, and whatever it might be, just treat it like a normal fluctuating value asset with very small fluctuations. And then you don't get runs because the price is adjusting. And investors who, what happened the last time, as everybody I think knows, is uh, the, they, they were trying to maintain, this is uh, the bed, father and son, brothers, it was called institutional index fund or something like that. And uh, all these institutions could see what was happening when Lehman collapsed. They had a huge amount of Lehman paper. I mean, over 1%, I think, and all of a sudden Lehman collapses. And everybody knows that it's not yet in the asset value, but it will be tomorrow. So you get out of today's price. These people are not stupid, these institutional managers. The poor public is going to be a step behind because you, you know, got to be watching these things like a hawk, as corporate treasurers have to do and are supposed to do. So um, you get this cascading effect. And it's, uh, you want to be the first to go and you can get a dollar, even though they're giving you a dollar for something worth let me say 99 cents or 98 cents. And that means for the half of all that are left in the fund, it's not 98 cents, but 96 cents. So uh, it's not, I think it's an industry that was built on the wrong premise. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of my, I tell people to be quite blunt about it, but I, you know, I'm thinking about writing one more book. I'm only, this is tongue in cheek. And it's going to be the largest book I've ever written. It's called mistakes I have made. <laughs> and uh, the reality is, as I look back on those mistakes, uh, that almost all of them were made for marketing reasons. For marketing reasons to make the thing look more attractive, or to jump on the bandwagon of a trend like real estate or specialty funds and that kind of thing. And it was just you know, unfortunate and uh, opportunistic, and words that I don't like to use about myself. And I've lived and learned from that, going back to the first merger uh, in 1966 uh, with, with the Boston Group. And uh, it, 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 we started the first money market fund with a $10 asset value. I mean, I was the, I really speaking from the book that I just that I just told you about. It fluctuates, let's show the world that it fluctuates. And nobody wanted it. There were all these funds with a $1 asset value. That was the mode. And so. Reluctantly, but I did it. It was my decision. No one else's, uh, and uh, so we changed to a dollar asset value. So my instincts led in the right direction, and it has not cost us anything. I don't regard our money market fund as a big mistake, but I do hope that some group of statesmen in this business will get together and say, "Look, the value fluctuates. How how bad is it to just recognize that? And if a lot of people don't want their money market funds." Well, that's just too bad. We're going to do it right and let them put the money in some CD somewhere or something like that. And uh, that's going to be painful. It'll be much more painful for Fidelity than it is for us, although we have a decent sized money market business. I guess about 200 billion. I don't know exactly. Uh, and uh, so there's a point at which you have to do what is right for the econ for the marketplace, for the economy. And if it's painful, well, there's a lot to be learned from taking a look at in this life. Well, Jack, it would also be painful for the investors because many investors use the money market funds for their checking accounts. So every time they wrote a check, it would be a taxable event. So how do you how do you address that situation? Well, it's the easiest thing in the world. I hate that excuse. Uh, <laughs> did I make myself clear? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have a tax exempt short-term bond fund. It's, a, it's a, basically a, a money market fund. Actually, I use limited term, a little bit longer. 
and it's basically a, a money market fund with a floating basset and net asset value. And so I get a little statement saying, here are the gains, here are the losses, here are the wash sales, and put this little number right down here in your tax return. Well, what's the matter with that? Uh, it's a simple one number, easy to understand, uh, easy to calculate, not easy for us to calculate, but, but Vanguard, and I presume other people, calculate it for you. And it's no different from having an equity fund, and you get a little 1099 and it says here's what your income was, and here's what your capital gains were, if any. And uh, so I don't see that that's a problem. Uh, I can see it might be a minor irritation. Uh, and actually, I'll tell you, my, my moral value has kind of slipped here a little bit. But before we ever got into that kind of an accounting system, uh, I, I still used the short term or the limited term mini bond fund. And I knew every year I had some gains and some losses. And I didn't know how to take into account wash sales because when you, you know, put money in or taking money out, that always comes up. And when you're getting paid the, the dividend, that can even come up. And I didn't know quite what to do. I didn't have any numbers. So I guessed. I put in my tax return $138 from long-term capital gains. And the next year I put in $272 from short-term capital losses. And the next year, I don't know what I put in. But I was never challenged. I wasn't trying to cheat. I just didn't know. <laughs> but within a couple of years of doing that, we got the whole tax thing straight. That's complicated from a computer standpoint but simple from an investor standpoint. So I don't have to guess anymore. And guess what, the gains were 138, the losses were 274, whatever one wants to say about them. So um, it, it's, I think, a trivial 